Um, so if anyone knows me or, or has stepped into my office, um, there's a, a few things that you see in there. Uh, there's some sports-related things, and there's a whole lot of purple, which I'm surprised I can get away with, with working for a company out of Nebraska, but it's not the 90s anymore, and Nebraska's not in the Big 12, so uh, I think that, that helps out a little bit. <coughs> So uh, the other day uh, when Jakin was, was having an uh, analogy about kind of the species and the plants, um, I, I, I thought of my joke that I like to tell last night, um, and it has to do with, uh, explain that to me in football terms. So last night for a couple hours I just sat there, I'm like, well, where, where does all these species and different types of species work into a uh, football scenario? So... Your grasses, uh, your legumes, those are going to be your star players. They're going to be your wide receivers, your quarterbacks, your running backs. Uh, a little bit taller, too. So then that brings me to the brassicas, which we're going to be talking about today. Brassicas are, are shorter growing. They don't get as tall. Um, these are your interior linemen. These guys are in the dirt. They're breaking up plays, breaking up compaction. Um, I don't think I've ever met a defensive lineman that smells good either, so they're releasing, they're releasing biofumigants, um, also known as glucosinolates. There we go, said it right, Zach. Um, so we'll, we'll get started on the brassicas here. Um, brassicas, also known as the mustard family. Um, they are known for having their deep tap roots, which that comes into play when you're, when you're breaking up the line of scrimmage. Um, also, for nutrient cycling, uh, as you know, if you guys do play football, some of the guards like to pull. So, uh, brassicas are able to pull up different types of nutrients. And they're also able to pick up on the offensive side uh, pests and pathogens, or that pesky linebacker that's going to blitz you all night. So... Uh, most have a low carbon to nitrogen, nitrogen ratio, um, so they're, they're going to break down relatively fast. If you see all those guys, they have knee braces on, and they don't last too long uh, in the NFL. Uh, they're also known as a great food source. Um, we're not going to talk about football on that one. Um, but, I mean, they're small-seeded. Anywhere from um, 100,000 to 175,000 seeds per pound, uh, minus radishes, which are about 25,000 uh, seeds per pound. So for a small cost, they're adding a bunch of diversity to your mix. And we've talked about uh, a lot about diversity um, for this event. So everyone on the football team has their job and, and what they're supposed to do. If you had, um, if you had a team full of brassicas or linemen, you probably wouldn't be very good unless you played in the 60s and 70s where uh, the power I formation was really popular, but um, that's not the case nowadays. All right, so for the first species, we have African cabbage. Um, this is an excellent uh, weed suppression cover crop. It's also high in the biochemical um, biochemicals, uh, glucosinolates, compounds to help control nematodes. It's going to have a more of an upright growing pattern, which makes it a good snow catcher, um, if, if that happens in your area, and not as much down here. Um, but this one also has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, making breakdown a lot slower compared to your other brassicas, and it can handle heat um, as well as moist soils compared to other brassicas, making it a good option for corn interseeding. Uh, as you can see on some of the maturity and the cold kill, I'll have these on all the slides, um, but brassicas, some brassicas are known to bolt, and those, that can cause uh, problems later on in the season if you're not wanting for all those little seeds to, to volunteer. So this one cold kills about 15 degrees, and those aren't hard, fast numbers. It usually has to be like that for a couple days. Uh, the next species is an impact forage collard. Uh, it's a cross between a Georgia, Georgia southern collard as well as another leafy brassica, making it one of the best uh, for grazing that we offer in the market. 
Uh, it's going to have better heat tolerance, which means it can be planted any time of the year, spring, summer, or fall. Most of the time, brassica is going to be cool season, so a lot of them don't handle heat very well, but uh, this is an exception. Another plus of the impact forage collards is it must vernalize to produce seed. So if you spring plant it, you don't have to worry about volunteer. Um, if you do fall plant it, you may worry about volunteer. Um, vernalization happens when it gets cold enough for the plant to go dormant uh, and then gets warm back up to then grow again. It's also one of the highest protein uh, brassicas for a non-legume plant. It has a high degree of digestibility. Um, and again, yeah, if you want to spring plant it to avoid it from seeding out. Um, it's also known as a PPS, whoops, a photoperiod sensitive plant, which means for it to go to seed, it goes off a day length hour. Um, and that one has a cold kill around Five degrees. Sorry, this button's sensitive. Uh, the next species, this is your nitro radish. This is going to be like your typical uh, oilseed radish, your, your daikon radish. It's going to have a deep taproot on it. Um, it's also a PPS plant, and it's best to plant radishes during the fall for rapid growth. Uh, but planting too early in the fall uh, may allow them to seed out, so that, that could be a, a worry for you. Mm. And they also break down fast-releasing biochemicals as well and help control pests and nematode populations. So this is smart radish. We'll revert back to football here for a little bit. This looks like uh, the 70s, 80s, and 90s Nebraska cornhusker lineman, that corn-fed beef right there. Whoops. Um, so the main difference between smart radish and, and nitro radish uh, is, is smart radish, not only does it grow a deep taproot, but it also has roots that grow out. Uh, the potential biomass above ground can reach up to 8,000 pounds per acre, with below ground reaching up to about 3,700 pounds per acre. It's, uh, it's best to plant radishes in late summer uh, or fall since spring planting um, Whoops. Yeah, since uh, spring planting may lead the radishes to bolting or producing seed. Uh, and that one has a, a 20 degree cold kill as well. And usually for, for us here in southeast Kansas, late January, but again, that's weather permitting. Uh, up next is the nematode control radish. Uh, this specific radish was bred up to control um, nematode, or the sugar beet cyst nematode and the Colombian root not nematode, that usually occurs in, in, in potato production. So if you're corn and beans, you, you don't have to worry about it as much. Um, let's see. All right, uh, up next is rapeseed. It's mainly used in grazing scenarios. It has rapid forage growth that can produce quality forage equal to alfalfa. Uh, this one with crude protein reaching around 16 to 17%. Um, it's also great at nutrient scavenging large amounts uh, of nitrogen up to 120 pounds an acre. Uh, rap rapeseed roots also have been known to um, aid in turning insoluble phosphorus into a more available form. It's also a, a great species for grazing. Um, That's kind of weird. Um, and also releasing the bio compounds, um, glucose uh into the soil. And that one's got a zero degree cold kill. There we go. Um, up next is purple top turnips. They're going to be higher in sugar content and moist and moisture, making them very palatable for grazing. They're also high in both calcium and potassium, uh, and they can accumulate sulfur over time. Um, however, the downside of this is once the whole plant gets eaten, the plant's pretty much done. It's about a, it's, it's a one and done species. 
Uh, but it can help add good diversity to your mix. And also another benefit is it must vernalize to go reproductive, so you can plant it in the spring and not have to worry about it going to seed. Uh, about a 75 or 70 to 150 maturity days, um, about a 10 degree cold kill as well. All right, um, up next is the Vivant hybrid turnip. Uh, this is a cross between an Asian leaf vegetable and a purple top turnip. Um, this one also has to vernalize to go to seed. Um, and this one is bred specifically for regrowth. Uh, however, a little bit more expensive for that trait. Unlike purple top turnip, this can be grazed multiple times uh, with that 70 to 150 maturity day. Uh, the next species is Bayou Kale. Uh, this is a hybrid between kale and forage rape. It can be used in late fall grazing um, due to a frost will actually sweeten the leaves uh, and, and increase palatability uh, for, the, for your ruminants. It also has a high feeding value equivalent to early spring grass uh, and senses of high crude protein between 16 and 18 uh, percent up to 25% protein in, in some of the leaves. It's also gonna be rich in uh, vitamins, uh, your A, C, and B groups, uh, as well as minerals, uh, such as your potassium, calcium, and this will also accumulate sulfur over time. Uh, here we get started in the mustards. These are gonna be your, your uh, we had a joke for them, our, our, our defensive linemen, they were called the, the big nasty. So these ones are, are releasing, releasing those biochemicals. Um, however, this bro Florida broadleaf mustard is gonna be the most palatable of all the mustards. Um, and it's gonna be really good at weed control. Uh, it typically does have larger leaves on it. Um, and you can use it in some grazing scenarios. It's not gonna be the most palatable, um, but I'm sure if, uh, Sure, it's out there, they're probably gonna eat it, so. And in, in grazing scenarios, it can also be used as a um, natural dewarmer. So if you're having problems with that, you can throw that in a cover crop mix. Uh, and some of the mustards, they have a, a 25 degree cold kill, um, so they're, they're not gonna survive too cold of winters. Um, the white gold mustard, is probably one of our fastest growing mustards. Uh, it's very good at weed competition. Um, you can see blooms in about 30 days or so, uh, which makes it a great choice for pollinator mixes or if you're wanting to get some uh, insects in there uh, and add some more diversity to your, to your fields. Um, and it also helps improve uh, fertility, such as nitrogen and sulfur. Uh, Indy Gold, um, after yellow mustard, is probably going to be our second fastest flowering plant. Again, it's going to be good for a pollinator mix. Um, and the Kodak, Kodiak mustard is probably the third longest to bloom after all those. It's going to be a good choice for a longer growing season. Uh, but it's best just to pair all those up. Again, diversity, and you're kind of hitting all the, the short, middle, and long term uh, flowering stages there. Uh, and then here we got winter camelina. This is going to be your, your nose guard. This guy, he's going to hang in there uh, even if it drops to negative five degrees. Uh, this is probably our most winter hardy brassica that we offer. Um, the cold tolerance can get up to, again, like I said, negative five. It can be grown anywhere cereal grain is grown. Uh, it produces a small rosette in the fall and then can grow more upright after uh, winter dormancy. This plant also helps with uh, nutrient scavenging uh, for nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and here we have arugula. Um, it's, not all, it's not only known for, for eating in a salad. Uh, you can also use, up, use it in a cover crop. It's a dense, low-growing brassica, which um, makes it great for weed suppression. And 
you can actually smell the biofumigant in it if you can taste it or if you can eat it. Um, and it can be spring planted and will continue to grow green all the way until late fall.